should hurry. What's the matter? Not a fan of sewers? for people but that would be like really grotesque um maybe i don't know i think uh what's his name the the bad guy that you kill about 18 times in the game um who simmons. turns in yes yeah, simmons he has he's he gets pretty nice power he gets to transform into monster after monster after monster and punch uh trains out of the way yeah and at the end he turns right back into a human so yeah and he, the whole time he just gets to suck right back in it's he's not like permanently transformed like it seems everyone else is yeah he's not like pierce where he uh is permanently stuck as mega man and seemingly getting worse <laughs> i think i'd just be like a normal juavo like nothing <laughs> is, i don't have cracks all over my body or anything i have extra eyes maybe i could see better yeah, you're gonna have to get a luchador mask. Yeah, I'm probably pretty strong. Like, after that, I could like lift stuff and yeah. And you get to job. work work in a completely uh, white lab. Ah, yes, I I wasn't there. I, that was I was. In oh office. right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Co-op action. Hey, I'm Grant, and this is Corbin, and welcome to Mega Busters. Today we're talking about Resident Evil Six. Resident Evil. Women. <laughs> the tagline, women. We played at co-op on a uh, no hope difficulty, and it was. I had fun. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, I thought it was. It's a fun game. It's like a a beautiful piece of trash. Um, but yeah, it's a really fun co-op game. If anyone was like looking for a good co-op game, I'd, I'd this would be one of the first games I'd recommend. Yeah. So for it, we played it in order uh leon i think uh corbin was leon i was helena then we did chris and then we did jake's story then we did ada's story so we got the full experience and it's worth noting that we we played through no hope dif difficulty as our first time playthrough so we didn't have like unlimited weapons and rpgs on level two or anything like that we went started completely fresh and played all the way through on no hope oh uh, yeah which, uh, if you look up any walkthroughs, everyone likes to uh, give you no hope walkthroughs and uh, tell you to equip the RPG uh, when you're at the beginning of the game, <laughs> which is so absurd. What did you think of Leon's campaign? I thought it was the most interesting or unique of the three, I guess, four. I'm not really counting Ada Wong's campaign, but mm -hmm. uh, just... I, two out of three, like, or one out of three, isn't that much of a divergence from the norm. But it was the one that was kind of unique, like, from the other two was about sort of running and gunning. On this one, your back is to the wall, and you're, like, just fighting off zombies, like in the traditional Resident Evil experience. I think that was what Leon and Helena's campaign was trying to be as much yeah. as they could. It felt like it was trying to answer the criticisms of 4 and 5, where it was like, all right, well, when are we going to actually fight zombies again? You know, we've been fighting these uh, Juavo the whole time, and uh, or, or various types of them, and Las now Plagas. we find... Yeah, Las Plagas, and now we uh, get to finally fight zombies, and they try to bring you back to its survival horror roots, though it's very much an action game. I would no way call this survival horror or other then you playing No Hope, you actually are very limited on ammo. It, we got into one situation once where we actually could not beat it. There was no possible way to do it because we had not saved up our ammo for this point. It was, you had to do a certain amount of damage to an enemy, and we could not, so we had to restart like the chapter over and play yeah, conservatively. Yeah, Me Lang was no longer an option, so we hit a brick wall. I was actually expecting us to run into the problems like this throughout the whole campaign since we hit this pretty early on. And uh, unexpectedly, that was the only time we ever ran into a, a total stop where we had to go all the way back and, and reevaluate how we were going to move forward. It had Definitely, Leon's campaign had the silliest plot, I would think. Well, maybe yeah. it's, it's a toss-up between her, his and like Jake's. Yeah, and, and the whole game. <laughs> um, yeah, 
with that being said, do you want to get into what the uh, uh, plot in quotation marks is for Leon's campaign? Cold's open. Leon kills the president. Helena's there. And she's like, oh, I know exactly what happened. I'll tell you later uh, once we get to this next place. And we get there. And she says, oh, just a little bit farther. Let's go down the, the stairs. The president is turning into a zombie. And Leon kills him. And, and then Helena very clearly knows what's going on. And then says, yeah, um, I'll tell you later. Just come with me. I'll tell you later. Even though she may have very well have infected the president, uh, Leon's cool with this. He's a patient dude. You know, it's just the president. And the rest and, of the uh, town. Not yeah, them. They're the immune. Whole city. I don't know. Right. Yeah, that's uh, something that is uh, always so evident, and it's in so many different scenes where everyone around you is turning into zombies, not from bites, but from a, like a disease or airborne pathogen. And the main characters are just completely immune, and there's no uh, lip service or explanation as to uh, why this why this phenomena occurs. I, I mean, at very least, someone could have said, uh, "Well, I, I guess I must have picked something up in the, the Raccoon City or something," you know. But no, nothing like that is said. They they just leave it in the air, um, and main characters are just immune to being zombified. So you finally get to where, like, Helena wants you to be. And she's pretty much just been blackmailed herself and, like, blackmailing you as well because her sister is kidnapped by mm -hmm. your boss, Simmons. And that's grounds for uh, committing high treason, killing the president, killing an entire town. <laughs> um, totally reasonable. Anyone would do the same in her position. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because her sister was kidnapped, she decides to kill the president and the whole entire uh, city surrounding. And they're at a university when the president is assassinated. I don't think we said that. Oh. Um, which is kind of a neat, neat level, I thought. It kind of brought you back to like a... It's kind of like a RE1 kind of vibes where you're like dealing in a, a you know one location kind of deal and it's all kind of dark and everything's very wooden, kind of creepy, but... Uh, yeah, I still wouldn't classify it as survival horror or anything. You're, I mean, you're just constantly shooting zombies. It's not like you're uh, just trying to scrounge up space to hold one last thing or anything like that, like you wouldn't like RE4, or the original RE trilogy or anything like that. You are you are constantly at least stocked up on something, and you're always shooting zombies. From there on, uh, we find oh, out that... Oh, sister turns into a zombie, yeah. Yeah, her sister turns into this naked... A uh, sea virus zombie that can sprout tentacles out of her back, and you go on a uh, minecart chase scene because, of course, you do. The classic. And yes, yes. You know who hasn't gotten themselves stuck on a, a racing minecart before? Indiana um, Jones has done it. Right, and you go about you go about a hundred miles underground, and if it, I guess you you kill her, and her and Elena have like this moment where she's like falling off a cliff and she drops her down no more teams. and yeah no more <laughs> and she finally drops her sister down this well and you like un you now this is where she finally reveals to you that the full story like my sister was kidnapped this way i killed everyone i'm a mass murderer but my sister is dead so it was all pointless anyway i just am a mass murdering terrorist um though the game never never waves these uh, moral ambiguities in front of your face. Um, you just get that deep. Yeah, you just kind of stare at it and scratch your head going, wait a second, what? Uh, am I, aren't I evil now then? And uh, then you go through an underwater section fighting a giant fish and you eventually get to a point where you find out that you have to go to China because your contact from RE4... Um, tells you that Simmons is behind all this, your boss, and he is heading to China. Uh, so you have to head to China, but you are, you and Helena, and rightfully so, are on the uh, terrorist list, uh, being hunted down. So to uh, travel to China inconspicuously, uh, you and Helena both board Air Force One, and uh, this is 
just out of nowhere. There's no explanation how they get on Air Force One. They're just they're just on Air Force One. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of Chinese people aboard Air Force One suspiciously. Uh, <laughs> a lot of them have rifles. I don't know if they're like the air marshals or something, but <laughs> they, yeah, the, everyone on board dies. They crash Air Force One into China, get out of it perfectly fine. It's a pretty big plane, I guess. Yeah, there's like a whole sequence where you're fighting a boss at, in the cockpit of the plane where one person is trying to fly the plane and the other person is trying to fend off this boss enemy. And after you successfully do this and you successfully take, take control of the plane, you instantly crash right into Shanghai. You just crash right through the middle of the city, just taking down buildings, everything in your path. But uh, yeah, you're good because you took control of the plane. Um, you and Helena walk out and immediately r run into Jake and Sherry. Yeah. Sherry. And, uh, yeah, from then we are introduced to the, their boss enemy that, that has been chasing them the whole time. Ustanak. Ustanak, yes, where you, you are introduced into the first four player co-op segment where if this game had just come out, you would be able to jump in, you and your friend would be able to join another two persons group playing through Jake's campaign and you are playing four player, all fighting this boss together, um, which is a mechanic that frequently uh, comes up throughout all the campaigns. So after they defeat Ustanak, they split up, they're going to go find and track down Simmons and they find him and Leon already knows that he's bad, but I, I apparently Jake and Sherry have not accepted this fact yet. Um, but as soon as you all run into him, he instantly flips the switch and goes into straight uh, comic book bad guy mode. And uh, everything he says from here on is just, I'm going to destroy the world. Uh, the world's going to be uh, mine. I'm going to rule everything, uh, which is a reoccurring event. Uh, throughout the entirety of the game. In Ada's campaign, he actually says like different stuff, like during the boss fight. It's like specifically to Ada, but that's all oh, right. We'll get there. Well, we go. Yeah, we go through a whole train sequence uh, where we're all we're just we're pretty much fighting Simmons all the way through to the end now. And uh, Leon and Helena kill Simmons about uh, ten times over. The first time he's like a bull and then he really turns into a gigantic bull and it's like a dinosaur at one point yeah then like he turns fly. into a, a t-rex monster and then he turns into a fly and he dies at the end of all of these sequences but he just keeps coming back and it's it gets to the point of just being absurd where it's just like how many times is this guy gonna die like it, it a little silly and it's something that happens in all the campaigns too. It seems like it seems like in the game altogether there were there was a lot of stuff that was just like, oh, it's this part again, but in this campaign, like it was. It felt like once they had finished one of the campaigns, or maybe when they began all of them, they made a formula, and you kind of just go through that formula throughout all the campaigns rather than being really all uh, unique experiences. They all just have like a few unique experiences sprinkled throughout. Chris kill Sim, yeah. You know, we finally kill Simmons, and then uh, we jump straight into Chris's campaign. So, Chris is drinking at a bar. He has amnesia. Apparently, his Pierre's Pierre Piers comes and like recruits him back into the force because that's what you do with an amnesiac alcoholic. Uh, army member you bring them back you don't just yeah you know leave them alone you want post-traumatized alcoholics belong on gun. the battlefield yeah. <laughs> so they do that you play a little bit to like discover his past and why he's so upset so he had some people died uh ada threw a little spike bomb at them and turned them all into zombies and Chris is pretty upset about that. So, but that's all over now once he remembers. Now he just wants to get revenge. So he's motivated primarily by revenge. That's all he wants against Ada, who he thinks is behind all this. 
Yeah, so. we, we should mention how Ada shows up in every single campaign uh, constantly. And sometimes she's dressed in red and sometimes she's dressed in blue. Sometimes she seems like a total villain, like killing all of Chris's team in front of his eyes. Um, and you don't really understand why, but you totally understand why. Um, there's obviously some sort of clone uh, thing going on here. And uh, it seems like she is the one with all the answers. Like, like she is constantly making, she, she doesn't give a single serious line of dialogue the whole time. She's just quippy and, and smart the, the whole entire game and just has, is just full of sass uh, throughout all the campaigns. But it seems like, okay, she, she is obviously the one that like is, is like three steps ahead of everyone. She's three steps ahead of all these characters and you're like slowly piecing together her story or trying to, even though it all feels very disconnected. Nope, it's not. It's she knows nothing. <laughs> it's, yes, eventually when you play through her campaign, you realize that's that's not the case at all. Chris uh, she, sees Ada in like her blue outfit and her red outfit, and he can't like piece it together. Like these are two different people. Like how do they change clothes so fast? He just never. No one brings that up ever. So Chris, yeah. is, what is he's he fights a snake. He goes down a slide. He uh, right, rides on a panda. Chris's campaign. As soon as we're done with his, well, actually, we we at first open up in China. Uh, his his campaign actually starts in Shanghai. Uh, fights the Juavo, and we eventually do the flashback bit where he's in Estonia, a fictionalized European country. Uh, where he witnesses, well, where you find out why he has his PTSD and what 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 happened to him and his squad, but um, his campaign is all in Shanghai, and you start off it like prior to I guess I guess they all start around the same time period to Leon's, um, but you, uh, you like play through to the point where Leon crashes into Shanghai and the zombies start to break out and you're going through all this and yes his entire squad is killed again his new squad is all killed by a snake in a building which I thought was actually kind of a cool sequence um, and kind of a callback to Resident Evil 1 where you fight the giant snake but it's done in a very different fashion in this one where it's actually an invisible serpent uh, squir squirming its way uh, floor by floor as you and your co-op partner are trying to stop it. It's not so significant that like you remember this story in every exact detail because it's just like oh okay, this, this happens and then you forget yeah. about it. Yeah, you, you end up on a uh, eventually he ends up on an aircraft carrier uh, where oh, you're, you're introduced Ada. to a, a whole yeah you're chasing Ada and you're introduced to like a whole plethora of new monsters that you don't see in any of the other campaigns. It kind of stands out too. Um, and like squid masks on. They're still Juavo, yeah. but they just have helmets. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I I, I kind of dug the uh, the aircraft carrier section. I uh, did not. Uh, yeah, it is kind of different. Like there at there are points where it's like there's so many enemies, especially on No Hope, where it's like there were points where we were just like there's too many enemies. We just we're just gonna run straight through them. Like that that's how many there are, and you just have to run to the next checkpoint. Um, a bit tedious there, just room after room after room of enemies. But yeah, and that's because uh, where Leon's uh, in intent is supposed to be the survival horror um, campaign. Chris's is definitely supposed to be the action campaign, and I'd say uh, Jake's is more of a combination of the two. Um, but that you then you enter a jet because you're gonna you, you're trying to stop a missile from hitting Shanghai that's going to infect everyone, turn them all into zombies, and they actually have a whole like jet flying sequence where one person gets to fly the jet and the other person gets to man the gun, uh, which I thought was kind of neat. Yeah, it was a little on, it was a little weird flying the jet like it didn't have traditional jet controls because they don't want to just throw like all that stuff at you. So it was kind of on rails, but I couldn't figure out like to what extent it was. So sometimes I thought I was turning, but like I wasn't. And sometimes it messed, it coincided. So I thought I was doing something, but really I wasn't. It was weird. It yeah. Was unique, and but weird. Mo most of the vehicle segments, it's, it comes clear, like how much of a lack of 
physics there are in this engine because like the there's also like a driving sequence where it's also just very strange feeling it's like this is like on rails but i have control of the car but I, it's not like i can like hit a wall and turn around or anything like that like i'm stuck going in a straight line i just have very minimal control over whether i go left and right to dodge cars um yeah, so uh, yeah, the driving sequences are neat to be there. Kind of a breaks up the pace, but uh, overall, yeah, kind of kind of awkward and not very well polished. So you stop one of the missiles. The other missile launches and infects Leon's campaign with slow-moving gas that doesn't hurt them but hurts everyone else around them. Yes, it's a it's smoke. It's a missile that explodes smoke all through Shanghai, and. The smoke instantly zombifies everyone. Uh, Leon and Helena, even though they're right next to everyone turning into zombies, they don't turn into zombies. Um, but there's a whole sequence through Leon's campaign where you're running from smoke. And it it just, yeah, just even thinking about it gives me a headache, just trying to think of logic of how this is working. They're, they like get in a car and they like drive through the middle of the smoke, but it's not a affecting them at all and Car yeah it has a really good air filter just <laughs> it's like airtight that car yeah well i'm sure they'll make a documentary of the science behind resident evil 6 and this will all be cleared up mm -hmm. um and then we'll look like fools <laughs> but in the game in the game it doesn't make a whole lot of sense <laughs> so but, yes chris gets a call from leon telling him that Jake and Sherry are in some sort of underground base off of an oil platform off the coast of China. I never understood how they knew this, but because like, no, I don't think that's ever said. I don't think she ever says, hey, Leon, help, we're trapped, save us or something like that. But uh, yeah, he knows somehow. So e you just everyone ends up. up in this underground bunker, uh, underwater bunker. Um, and it's kind of inexplicable how everyone knows exactly where that is. Maybe in this time period, everyone's like fully aware of like this under underwater uh, base that they've been building, and they just don't they don't tell you that. It's like, oh yeah, that thing. Like it's you can't cover that up. It's huge. It's like <laughs> three miles deep. Yeah, there's obviously a good amount of construction that went into there for a long, long time. And yeah, especially at the end of. Uh, Jake's campaign you you really get an idea of how huge this thing is this thing is just un ungodly huge just miles and miles and miles it probably takes up like half the ocean <laughs> for how long you're skyrocketing through this underwater base <laughs> what's the center for all their lava based technology which I'm sure we'll get into later yes well yeah throughout the campaigns lava is just unbelievably ubiquitous you just see lava everywhere all the time it's you know like real life where just lava is all over the place but it gets to a point of absurdity where you're just like is everything just lava powered like you go into a um the aircraft carrier and it's the whole bottom of it's just filled with lava there's just a whole section of lava everywhere and then you go in the un underwater base and there's just lava everywhere and uh i think you're in a, a jake and sherry's where you have to deal with the like moving elevators that are constantly going up and down is that is that the underground underwater base as well or is yeah, that somewhere else same place okay yeah that's the same place you but yeah there yeah you share their story you like fight with that's this, another co-op four player then you fight with them on this like moving elevator platform thing around this cocoon which you've never seen before but like this is supposed to be the actual final like thing that's going to destroy the world like this is what everyone should have been worrying about this whole time but it just like shows up it's in a cocoon this is this is it uh i don't know why they brought jake and shelly there but this is where everyone fights that thing uh, actually chris and uh peers fight that Jake and Shelley run and like do stuff, but uh, the BSAA, that's their deal to take down bioweapons, and that's a bioweapon, so they just take it. 
It's a giant right. like, skull monster surrounded by jelly. It's like <laughs> chaos from Sonic Adventure, but a little more human. Yeah, I think it's worth noting how we had to beat that thing. Oh, yeah. Um, we ran out of ammo. There were little boxes, but it just wouldn't give us enough ammo. So Chris is the only character with a knife. Uh, Piers just has a normal melee attack. And so I had to get around the giant monster to his back and just slash at it with a knife for, for like 30 for about, minutes. Yeah, yeah. For, for about like yeah, 15 to 30 minutes of just recorded. knife slashing. Yeah, we'll, we'll get that in here. <laughs> But it's uh, yeah, it's kind of magnificent. Uh, that's what you have to resort to because you already are lacking in ammo altogether, and it does not even give you a quarter of the ammo required to actually beat this thing. Um, yeah. Like the knife actually becomes absolutely essential to even beating this campaign. So, like this part of the story is the only part which I would say I liked. I hesitate to say that, but I liked <laughs> it. Had the like coolest relative to everything else like thing that should have been there all along. It was just a moment, a glimmer of brilliance. But uh Pierre's gets like wounded gravely during that and he like he's missing an arm and there's like one vial of C virus that like falls out of his pocket or something that he's been carrying this whole time. <laughs> or that he confiscated from Ada or something. So he like crawls over to it and stabs himself with the C virus and he becomes a BOW. Ooh. And he grows like this arm that shoots electricity. So yeah, this was definitely my favorite part in the game too. Is like it was like this was the first time in any of the campaigns where it's, and I think the only time where it felt like there were actual stakes. It was like a main character might actually die here. Like some like irreversible consequences are occurring. And um, yeah. Uh, Pierce turns, injects himself and grows this monster arm and essentially turns into Mega Man. He starts growing blue and gets veins all over him and his arm, his arm regrows back into a uh, elect, electricity shooting uh, laser bolt arm um, and you have to fight the boss a second time. Uh, now with Pierce um, having the advantage and being able to shoot uh, laser bolts out of his arm with unlimited ammo, which I thought was... Probably my favorite favorite sequence in the whole game. But uh, you, we eventually defeat him uh, through Pierce, and even though Pierce has a Mega Man arm and has been shooting him relentlessly, uh, Chris still manages to kill him with his knife, of course, and uh, Pierce is just slowly transforming into a monster. You can see by the end of the boss fight, he, he is like, his face is just totally gone. He's just completely transforming and he's you know cliche moment where he puts they're like all right let's get out of here and then pierce closes the door behind chris and he goes you just you i'm staying behind and shoots chris up to the surface through a uh a um an, es an escape pod uh, that shoots you uh to the surface of the water uh pressure be damned <laughs> and uh, the beast comes after Chris one last time, and Pierce somehow knows this being in the base and goes ultra super saiyan and blasts the monster from inside the base and kills him. And Chris is now a reformed man that no longer suffers from PTSD, having lost his entire team a second time, and now his best friend. He was going to retire. He was like been saying through the latter half of the campaign. It's like after this, I'm done. But no, that's that's the moral of the story. You never retire once you're in the military. You just keep <laughs> on going until you die. All right. Well, that leads us into Jake and Sherry's campaign. And by by this point, uh, it's worth saying that more than half, I'd say probably more than half of Jake and Sherry's campaign consists of scenes from the other two campaigns um, because now you've played through more than half of the segments and you're you're just it, it's literally just recycled content you're you're now you're starting to get into the point where you're watching recycled cutscenes and recycled levels and re recycled boss fights um, where uh, Chris's campaign uh, is in Estonia where his uh, former team is killed and everything. And this is where Jake's campaign opens. And it actually, um, well, very early on, you 
jump straight into the, one of the boss fights that you have with uh, Chris, but now you are on Jake and Sherry's side um, fighting this boss. Um, but you find out that Jake is Albert Wesker from Resident Evil. Uh, His son. Yeah, you're 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 Albert Wesker's son. So you get inherited kung fu powers, in which um, where Chris would have a melee knife, uh, Jake has uh, the ability to go all Jason Bourne, and you can equip his fists, and he'll do kung fu moves on zombies. So from there, uh, Jake and Sherry kind of, they, they're constantly fighting this, uh, what's his name, Ustinik? Ustinok. Ustinok. Uh, he is a, he's very clearly supposed to be the nemesis of this game where he, you are fighting him from the very beginning and you are fighting him all the way to the very end. He, he is the, he's the first boss and he's the final boss uh, that uh, Jake and Sherry fight. And essentially... There's not really much to even talk about in this campaign other than that boss fight that just keeps reoccurring and you just kind of go in between each person's campaign. You, you go from you go from Estonia to Shanghai and then and then to the under underwater base. Um, I guess we could talk about like the stealth sequence was pretty the, cool. Yeah, there's a whole stealth sequence where you get captured. Um, there's actually twice two points. Where you get captured, which is a very convenient plot device that they use to not have to tell any story for them. Um, move them to the next place where plot happens. Yeah, yeah they, they get captured, and then it literally, because you're in Europe, which is in the past, in, Jake, in uh, Jake's campaign, or sorry, in Chris's campaign, you get captured, and then you wake up, and all of a sudden it just says six months later. So now, so now the stuff in the other people's campaigns can now occur without you going, What? But <laughs> it's all very convenient because you got you get captured and now you're in China. That's that's convenient, very nice. Uh, you're in fact you're in Shanghai, the same city that everyone else is going to be in. Um, but it was kind of neat. It's the it's a it's the only stealth sequence. Or no, I guess Ada had some stealth sequences too. But it's the first stealth sequence that you get. And you kind of a co-op stealth sequence where each person is dealing with their own stealth level. Um, that's completely individual from one another, and you both are relying on one another to succeed in your own stealth level, which I thought was kind of a neat mechanic, and it took us quite a few tries to complete. Yeah, like it had a unique thing where you hide in a cabinet and you see an enemy punch a card, like punch some uh, password into a box, and then you have to repeat that same password because you were peeking over his shoulder watching him do it so you can get through the next door, and like Corbin didn't see that like I had to describe the shapes of the password to him so that he could progress I don't know if that's how it's supposed to go because I couldn't imagine how that would actually work say like one person doesn't have a mic or like is the AI going to tell you what the password is supposed to be I don't know I, su I suppose there's so few shapes that it would only take about three minutes to actually figure it out um, <laughs> if you didn't have a partner or no mic oh, and um, the and password I guess that's how they avoid that is the same exact password like throughout the campaign like the enemies have one password that they use in all of their security systems no matter where they are if they're on a submarine if they're in Europe, <laughs> if they're in china it's and it's always three password. three digits yes three digits that are actually three shapes they don't have a security advisor they just have simmons and zombies that's <laughs> the hierarchy yes the, the and they're brilliant too I don't think we mentioned the reason why uh, Simmons wanted to kill the president and everyone else. It's because the president was talking about revealing the secrets of Raccoon City and about the zombies. So Simmons goes, oh, okay, uh, to not get that revealed, uh, how about I turn the president into a zombie and everyone into a zombie? That, that's the logic we're dealing with in this game. So uh, we don't want to destabilize the status quo. People wouldn't trust the United States anymore. So right. to do that, we have to make everyone zombies. Then no one will be distrustful of anyone because everyone will be dead. Problem solved. Yeah. Simmons is, yeah, Simmons is brilliant. Um, so we, in the, in the cell sequence, and we're in Shanghai, we deal with uh, uh, Leon again, and we find ourselves... Uh, uh, Kidnapped very quickly 
after fighting Ustinik one last one more time because he's in China too, of course. And we find ourselves kidnapped, and what do you know? We wake up after being kidnapped in the un- underwater base that Chris ends up. How convenient. Um, seems like these enemies are just trying to make us uh, line up with the other characters constantly uh, without having any excuses as to why this is happening. Um, so we are in the underwater base, and while you have the elevator sequence that Grant previously discussed, and from there, when the boss hatches, where Chris's final boss begins, uh, of course, Who Jake and up? Sherry in, end up fighting Ustinik, who's in who's in the un- underwater base, because of course he is. And I think this was I think this was a great boss fight because this is like the full culmination of everything you've experienced in the last two campaigns, and in this one, you are fighting him in Lava World area mm-hmm. where every everything is just lava and you have to fight him in this whole place of lava where you're about uh, four inches from uh, lava hitting your feet yeah you're standing um, on like dried lava which is still yeah. lava like it's, you still can't stand on it in reality <laughs> like he breaks <laughs> he, it open and he throws you into lava, lava but you land you land on a dark spot of the lava so you're fine and then you have to fight him on the dark spot of lava it's okay, it's just, it's dark, so it's not molten. As long as it's not molten, you're good. Right, I think that's the rule. This lava that. technology has progressed uh, so far. Like, people just <laughs> lava-proof all their shoes and clothing, just in case. Like, some lava leaks out of your smartphone or something. Like, people right. know this already. Everyone's transparent smartphones. Um, that everyone has. Everyone has the exact same phone in this, this day and age. Um so you defeat Ustinik, and I liked how this one ended, at least, where uh, you lose your weapons. At least Jake does. I was playing as Jake, so I didn't get to see Sherry's perspective. Yeah, she does, too. She yeah, doesn't, like, and, use them. but yeah. Okay. And um, you are forced to Jason Bourne fist fight your way uh, through Ustinik while your co-op partner has to throw uh, mine carts remotely into Ustinik while you're fighting him. So you have like this co-op dynamic happening um, where you can eventually throw Ustinik in the lava. I'm sure he's done with. Uh, So from there, you immediately get onto a platform that starts shooting you at about 200 miles an hour um, in a gigantic spiral up to the surface. um, And you are... you. You are shooting at like 200 miles an hour. Like no one can even hold on to this thing, how fast you're going. No one can keep their feet planted. And um, of course, the place starts exploding and Ustinik shows up and now he's a lava Ustinik. And you have to fight him through like a... Do you, I don't even think there's a real fight sequence here. It's just quick time events, right? Yeah, you're either like crawling away from him or you're like shooting him when it gives you the chance to. Right. And eventually you kick him off into the... Well, yeah, you kick him under the train, right? And he gets run over? Uh, I think you shoot him at the end. That's how you beat him. Like, Oh, right. His heart is exposed and, and they never figured out his weakness was bullets. There's like a so... crate full of guns and it breaks open and like one gun like sticks in the grate that you're up against and Jake grabs it, but he can't like hold his hand steady. So he needs Shelly's hand to do it. <laughs> so they both like grab the gun and like aim it and fire it. And then at the end they hold hands and then a vocal song plays for the credits because that's what you do in Resident Evil. That's the classic uh, vocal guitar credit and song. Then Jake's, Jake's uh, motivation this whole campaign was that his blood is going to be the cure to the virus. But he says, okay, that's fine. Give me $50 million. And at the end, it, it's clear that Jake has a thing for Sherry, um, but she kind of has a thing for everyone except Jake. <laughs> and um, there's like this jealousy dynamic that the writers try to pull off. And at the end, Jake decides to give his blood for $50 and not get Sherry. He just goes off on his own with $50. 
yeah, he goes to uh, some Middle Eastern country and fights zombies for uh, the price of an apple. Is That's the uh, final epilogue after Ada's campaign. Yeah, such an honorable, honorable way to go. So that's the, that's the end of Jake. Uh, do you want to talk about Ada's campaign? Yeah, sure, briefly, because we've already spent like 40 minutes talking about everyone else. Yeah, let's <laughs> go through it quick. So Ada is being called by Simmons, and he says, Hey, I've left you a hint. Go over here to this submarine. or give it coordinates to a submarine. She goes there. There are some Drovel zombie there with the squid masks on. She sneaks through there. She like finds the computer with all this stuff on it. And there's another thing where she goes like to some underground lair where Leon campaign intersects with, and she finds out some more stuff like a tape with Simmons in it and another Ada being born. But then like she finds out that the clone of Ada that you just saw on the tape is talking to her, which is like named Carla, which is just Simmons like worker, co-worker, like she just turned herself into a clone of Ada because that's how clones work, right? So. Yeah, the, the, it's that really confusing. That, there's a clone of you walking around, you're trying to figure it out, and there's like a revelation scene where she pulls a picture out of the drawer and she sees Simmons um, with a, a blonde girl under his shoulder and it's clear from the music that this is supposed to be the big revelation moment where you understand everything. And the whole time I was just like, what the hell is happening here? Um, so and, blonde girl. <laughs> apparently, apparently clones are made by picking a random person and saying, I want this person to be a different person because that's how the cloning works here. And it works. And uh, <laughs> just like her. They get this voice. blonde girl and turn her into uh, Ada Wong's clone. And uh, this is done because Simmons has a crush for Ada Wong. And Ada, I guess, left um, to get Jake out of there for some reason. And uh, uh, out of Simmons' hands. And Simmons got so jealous that he said, I'm going to clone this girl with another girl. <laughs> That's the logic you're working with here. So I guess Carla's whole motivation is to... Dist- Carla's in charge of the cocoon. Like, she wasn't doing the missiles thing. That was all Simmons. She's w- working on the cocoon project. So she wants to destroy the world. She wants to sabotage Simmons. That's why she gets Ada involved in the first place. So that mm-hmm. like she can sabotage everyone. Uh, she just hates the world and wants it to be destroyed. Uh I don't know if she always wanted to do this or if she was just jealous of Ada or something. I don't know. That's not explained. Yeah, and she gets killed by Simmons, I guess. Simmons' group kills her, shoots her through the chest, and then she turns into a giant glue monster because the sea virus is just... It's completely arbitrary what the effects are going to be on you if you get hit with the sea virus. You might turn into a bull, a a fly, a a T-Rex... It's like a uh, green lantern in, ring. It's just based on your creativity. You might turn in. You might turn into a giant glue monster. Yeah, it's. You. It just My does anything. Arm. Yeah, it does anything. That's. That's the logic you're dealing with here. Uh, so yeah, and, and then eventually at the end, Ada goes into the lab where I guess her clone was created and. A tear goes down, rolls down her cheek while she's shooting the place up and destroys it. And that's the end. Yep, it solved all the, everything. All the answers <laughs> are revealed. <laughs> and where you think that, like, she's supposed to be the smart one. She's the one that's, like, ahead of everyone. And I think that would have been a really cool campaign It was if it was, like, I already know all the facts. Like, and, and the player, like, is catching up with her. I think that would have been a cool dynamic. But no... She's just a bumbling idiot like everyone else, just trying to figure out what the hell is happening and is just kind of going through the motions and just happens to intersect with everyone's campaign at every single turn that she makes. Okay, so that is Resident Evil 6 campaign. (laughs) Let's talk about some mechanics. Yeah, all right. So um, I want to talk to about the the co-op mechanics of the game. Um, and like how it compares to other games. 
Um, I really like the co-op in this game. Um, it's kind of it was kind of a nuisance in Resident Evil Five, um, and it carries over here where two people are constantly having to open up doors together. But um, not only just to load the next level, I think, but it also keeps you and the other player together at all times, which I think is a, a good mechanic in the at the end of the day where you're constantly helping each other. And I like the health mechanic as well, where if one person pops a health pill, it also uh, help, heals the other player as well. So it, there's constant incentive for you guys to always stick next to each other and have each other's backs. Right. The... Uh unique mechanics the moment of brilliance that they have that isn't everywhere throughout the game just in certain spots like a uh, jake and sherry's split up stealth section where they're in completely different environments and like the peeking over shoulder to get the password stuff that stuff was cool they they don't do enough of that sort of stuff it was kind of all just action movie shoot the zombies stuff yeah it's and unique, it, but the, the four-player co-op segments where it throws two two pairs of players together is a really cool concept, but I don't think it was done very well, um, where it's almost impossible to get a four-player game going today because um, that is so many factors. You have to be playing at the same difficulty. You have to be at the exact same part at the same time. The chances of you running into a four, two other players now are, are just almost none. Um, it's really a mechanic for when you first get the game. But the problem I had with it mainly was that if you do happen to get a four-player game going and one person is super incompetent and can't figure out where to go or how to play or or gets killed constantly, if one player dies, you all are split up. It's just you are back to the two and two and not together again. Um, so I think it's a cool concept, but I don't think it was realized very well at all. One of the cool things they have is agent hunt where you can be a monster and you can join someone else's game and you can attack them as the monster and you get points for like how long you stay in their worlds it's kind of like a dark souls invasion sort of thing we turned yeah. it off immediately because <laughs> during the bus sequence we were getting assaulted and we thought there's no way we could beat this part and well have to deal for with the it. lack of resources that you have on no no hope i mean it just it just consumes your resources like no one's business because the other player always takes control of a uh, a powerful enemy not not just some random zombie character they always take control of one of the ones that are very uh take a whole lot of damage to kill there's a lot of glimpses of uh of brightness but i, I don't think it comes together as well as I think they were hoping for. Uh, it's if you play Resident Evil Five, it, it's the exact same game going on here, um, with just a few few very minor differences. Same animations, like everyone has this like Sheva's jump, uh, co-op leap animation, like that same thing is there for the female characters at least. Uh, Jill's uh, kind of breakdance animation during her <laughs> boss fight, like that's in Deborah's boss fight there are yeah, some more al things. almost every animation is recycled from Resident Evil 5 and, and at some point in some way um, which is a little lazy and it's obviously using the exact same engine a um, little too much asset flipping going on uh, from the previous game but I mean overall they made a pretty lengthy campaign they, they just got away uh, with it by having so many scenes that repeat through everyone's campaign they were able to make something that was longer than your average campaign than you'd expect um so this is resident Evil 6 is very relevant now because we are supposedly on the verge of playing resident evil 7 even though we haven't gotten a single trailer of actual gameplay in the actual game but they say it's coming out in two months yeah a little, uh, we'll a see over one month since it's the 25th yeah. Yeah, so uh, we'll see if that game ends up coming out. Um, but they are saying it is. So we'll take their word for it at this moment. Um, it's going back to Fortnite, but, uh, supposedly, which is a thing that yeah, they broke, it's, starting with Resident Evil 4. Like, the whole survival horror thing, it turned into an action movie from Resident Evil 4 onward. So good for them. They uh, 
broke new ground. They gained a new fan base of people who wouldn't otherwise be interested in their franchise. They got a whole bunch of money from it. Like it, yeah. And I, outsold. I think everyone, I think everyone was expecting them to go full reboot, and this kind of seems like it's a full re- reboot. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this was originally just Resident Evil, and then they just decided to make it seven because they were like, well, we can put this picture here and it will connect them with all the other games. I haven't played it yet, but that's what I'm. That's I'm. I'm just going to make that wild assumption um, because it really is a total reinvention of the whole franchise. I mean, we're now we're going back to survival horror, but not only survival horror, we're going into a first person view where PT got canceled and it's very clear. Capcom said, okay, we'll, 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 we'll take it from there. We'll, we'll do that because everyone loved PT, um, which is kind of unique and uh, interesting because Re- yeah, Resident Evil 4 changed up the formula completely. And RE4 was considered such a masterpiece that they just said, okay, that again, let's do co-op this time. And then Resident Evil 6 was just kind of a continuation of Resident Evil 5. Uh, And I think people were getting really tired of uh, it just being a straight action game um, and little more than that. Um, So, yeah, I'm I'm excited to see what this new Resident Evil ends up coming out to be. for For them to, like, change it up like they're doing... Like first it's survival horror, now it's action adventure, now it's back to survival horror. They they can't have both. They can't maintain both of the fans that they have by doing this. You're either gonna like make one people one set of people unhappy at the expense of the other, or vice versa with action adventure or survival horror. Uh, it it seems like I I. If I were in charge of stuff, I would never want to do that. Just like say, oh, well, too bad for you, survival horror fans. You're not getting any more survival horror from us. We're going after this new fan base. Just you can do that. Just call it a different game entirely and just keep your Resident Evils over here or just stop making them and start making action adventure zombie punching if that's what you want to make just <laughs> yeah, boulder punching yeah don't pretend it's the same thing because that's yeah way and to treat i actually fans. think i actually think the new one's kind of a ballsy move because resident evil 6 actually sold better than any of the other resident evils but it got the worst reviews of all the other games uh so kind of dealing with the you know dichotomy there but i think it was i think they made the right move where they're like okay the next one is not going to sell well. Like if we just if we just make another Resident Evil 6.5, you know, that's just the same engine, same assets, everything, people aren't going to buy it. Um, and I think that's a safe assumption to make. So they're going, they're taking their fans' advice and they're saying, oh yeah, you know that PT game you loved, we're we're doing that now because that was canceled. Even though they like to say that this was in development before PT. Uh, I'm not buying it, <laughs> but, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see. I played the, uh, Resident Evil 7 demo and, um, I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. It's not half as scary as what PT was, but, uh, it's definitely, you know, very atmospheric, which I think harkens back to the original three games and even Resident Evil 4, I thought was very atmospheric too. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I think they're, I think they're doing something, uh, that's going to be worthwhile, or at least I'm hoping so. Speaking of Capcom and the, how they treat their fans, uh, they had a whole kerfuffle over on disc DLC. They had a bit of outrage, and they responded to that outrage in a way that kind of was an olive branch. They said, okay, we're going to turn all of our on disc DLC that was on the game completed, but we're going to charge you for it. We're going to just give that to you for free like we should have and we're yeah. going to give you some extras like no hope difficulty which is what we played on uh ada wong's campaign now has a co-op partner that we shoehorned in there that has no relevance to the plot but that doesn't even actually canonically exist but you can you can play it co-op That's yeah you can gift. play this single player campaign co-op even though the person is so non-existent that he can't even open doors Ada is the only person that can open doors in her her co-op campaign, um, which is kind of neat. It would have been neat if they gave that uh, actual uh, story relevance, like if they said this person's like part of her psyche or imagination or something. 
Um, but they don't. He, the person was just, yeah, totally shoehorned in. He's, he doesn't even have a face. He's just wearing a mask. He looks like generic soldier man. That's and his, a, name, his name is literally Agent. That's what you would expect from, like, other games where co-op is obviously shoehorned in, like the uh, Black Ops games. It's, it's really just one person. And, like, every time it goes into a cutscene, it's like your voice, whoever you're playing as doing the talking. It's like you're canonically, your partner doesn't exist. It's, that's the sort of thing I would expect them to do. But it's, yeah. it's for them to, it, it's definitely shoehorned in. You can tell when things are made to be co-op and when things aren't. But it was a good show yeah. of faith on their part. It was a good a thing for them to do that they should have done in the first place. Not specifically like the agent thing, but just giving the yeah. on-disc DLC for free is what they, they made peace. <laughs> Well, I think before we wrap up, I think it's worth talking about the writing in this game. Um, this game has some of the greatest writing I've ever heard. Um, if you thought The Last of Us had good writing, wait till you play Resident Evil 6. Uh, right off the bat, uh, Leon says one of my favorite lines of all time, uh, where they leave the campus and they go into the sewers, and Leon turns on his flashlight and says to Helena... What's wrong? Not a fan of sewers. Which I think is pretty beautiful. <laughs> pretty pretty beautiful line writing. Also, um, I'm not part of this SJW culture or anything like that, um, but it's hard to deny this game is a little bit sexist <laughs> to the point where it's almost uncomfortable how sexist it is being at times. There's a Many times where male characters uh, just use the term women. They, they just, the girl will do something or say something and the guy will just go, Ugh, women. Which, which is actually the final line that's said uh, in Leon's campaign, but it's said in multiple times throughout all the campaigns. It's Resident Evil 6. Women. <laughs> Then a guitar strum. <laughs> that's that's the final moment you're treated with. Yes, and it's beautiful. So um, was he always this awesome? <laughs> was was he always this awesome? He's talking about Chris. Um, yeah, there's there's so many gold nuggets of writing in this game. I I would love to see the process of how this game was written. You're you're. Destroying my family. Yeah, there's just so many moments. I, I, I'm curious whether this game was actually written by a, a writer or if this was just, they just kind of made story as they went and just kind of made dialogue. And I don't know if this game was lost in translation or if the writing really was just this the whole time. This is um, what I, I had guessed in the... Like, they made this, the Japanese made this, in terms of what a Western gamer <laughs> would want to see. Like, this is what they think we like. Uh, for yeah. the most part, we do, but act, judging by, like, our box office and stuff like that. But uh, I think, yeah, I think you hit the nail right on the head. Um, explosions, big muscles, uh, fist fights out of nowhere. Uh, yeah, boulder punching mysterious plots yeah uh it it's kind of amazing how, how low this uh the writing goes in this where it's just like i can't believe they they actually wrote that like that was a scene that was written um and it's yeah it's just constantly amazing you <laughs> i haven't played the first resident evils but they do yeah like and that's what i was gonna say deep places See, resident evil one was very 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 hammy in its writing um, but it was unintentional. It felt like it was really lost in translation where you get your whole Jill sandwiches and all that. <laughs> they have this, like the itchy... this house is filled with monsters and demons. <laughs> they have like but, some deep and the... scary places too, like the itchy scratchy, like the, uh, di the diaries that you find that are like kind of where some of the horror comes from. Mm -hmm. Some of the depth... I think the difference between the writing in Resident Evil 1 where it's super hammy in this is like in this it feels like they actually want you to take the story seriously 
But you, just like you said, you end up with this writing that they feel like they're catering to the American audience, and it just sounds so ridiculous and absurd because they just apparently they perceive Americans as just these stupid, idiotic creatures that can only understand boulder punching and guns and explosions constantly. I thought it's always a little bit dif difficult to separate like the co-op experience that you have from like the quality of the game itself because I had fun just playing this with you and I would probably have fun playing anything with you. It doesn't matter how bad the game is but mm -hmm. like it's it's always there. It's always looming over you. It's always gonna like be in my the back of my mind that this review was tainted somewhat by my co-op experience of playing this with you but i'm gonna try my best just be warned uh i'm gonna give it yeah i'm gonna give it three panda rides out of five uh it's it's an average game it's not it's fun i had fun but it's just average. You can get better experiences elsewhere. But if there's nothing else for you to do, you've played all those better experiences, why not? Just pick it up. You'll have fun. It's just not anything great. Just not anything perfect. Just it's average. Yeah. Um, yeah, I pretty much agree with all that. I mean, I, I pretty much think about what this experience would be like if I was playing by myself. And I have to be honest, if I played it by myself... I don't think this game would ever be finished. I think I've tried playing through this game like three times now, um, usually by myself, and I've never finished it um, because this game just gets so boring and tedious and repetitive. But, I mean, it's a fantastic co-op game. I mean, I recommend it to anyone if you can get this on sale and you have a partner that you know is going to, you're going to be able to play with uh, through the whole game uh, frequently. Um, I'd say definitely get this game because it is a very solid co-op experience. Other than that, the game it just it's hard to it's hard to come up with positives for it if it's just a single player experience. I mean it's recycled content from Resident Evil 5, horrible atrocious writing, a story that doesn't really make much of any cohesive sense, uh, just cartoon villains that have no motivation at all other than to be bad and to destroy the world. Um, so, I mean, because it has the redeeming factor of its really solid cooperative campaigns, um, I am going to give this, uh, two sewer fans out of five. Yeah, definitely, if you're playing with co-op, you, you both got to have mics. You both have to make fun of the story because that's where the bulk of the entertainment value comes from. All right. Well, uh, we'll catch you up on the next Mega Busters. See you later. We should hurry. What's the matter? Not a fan of sewers?